and just wrote this. Right. This is the uh, Neo Books call for Monday, October 30th, 2023. And uh, Klaus was in the eye of the hurricane, so to speak. Actually, not the eye, the front face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very scary. Um, cool. A a any any uh, thoughts, progress? I, I know that um, Bill Anderson has looked at your manuscript and has some comments for you that he's going to post shortly, I think. Um, and there are a couple other people who have been helping like review it. So we've got some progress there. Um, and then Pete and I have done some thinking about what happens next and, and where it goes, but we've got some, some more thinking to do when, once we get a little closer to that goal. Um, any updates from either of you? Any thoughts? Well, this volume one has been, um, has been really useful so far. No? Um, I mean, the astonishing discovery that uh, climate models have not incorporated the hydrologic cycles um, it was, was just a stunner. No? Um, and uh, um, I got into a conversation on LinkedIn between Montbiot and Savory. I actually had an exchange with Alan Savory on LinkedIn. Um, and then I and he responded in lengthy, uh, lengthy tirades, you know, wanting to explain himself. And I ran this through the AI because what I realized is that Monbiot is is a bright orange guy, whereas Savory is bright green. So when they were uh, combating, you know, they had set up this ex this uh, conference where they wanted to battle each other's. Uh, uh, position, it was a total failure um, because Monbiot what is you know the, the same experience that I had with the Sierra Club. You know when I published uh, a couple of papers, where the way that Monbiot talks is just deeply offensive to to Savory and what Savory talks about, uh, Monbiot doesn't even capture. I mean, he doesn't even process what. Uh, what what uh, um, uh, Savory is trying to express. So what it what I was able to boil it down to is that Monbiot looks at uh, soil recovery as a balancing act between get, uh, greenhouse gases going in and out. So he's basically declaring uh, rotational crazing a failure because the total. Uh, contribution of methane gases and CO2 generated is at best zero, and it may actually be positive. Whereas, more, whereas Savory is saying the success factor that you need, the, the measurement you need to use is the recovery of the soil microbiome. Because when you recover the soil microbiome, uh, you, you uh, uh, diversify biology, uh, and you regenerate the capacity of the soil to absorb an old water, which which restarts the hydrologic cycles. So they're talking like, you know, <clears throat> two planes crossing by each other about completely different things. But it also exposed that Montbiot really doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, it just doesn't make sense what he's saying. So, um, so I was able to use this AI to, to first of all crystallize what is the difference between these two arguments and then which one makes more sense. Um, love that, really interesting. And did Savory go along with this? I mean, did, did you interact as far as this, what you're explaining right now with him? And yeah, did that he make was, any difference uh, He made a comment um, saying this is really very interesting and uh, this level of intelligence supersedes uh, uh, human intelligence. You know, I mean, he, he felt that the way the um, argumentation was put together is something that he couldn't have done, in other words. Uh, wow, that's super interesting. Um, as a small side note, yesterday, the Oregon Mycological Society had their annual, but they haven't had it in several years because pandemic, <laughs> exhibit over nearby, like, seven minutes away at the Oregon, near the Oregon Zoo, there's a bunch of buildings. 
And so I went, I'll, I'll post an album of photos of uh, mushrooms because one of the things they do is a whole bunch of people go out and harvest mushrooms nearby. And there's this insane variety of mushrooms on long trays, all freshly picked in soil with like bark and leaves and tree stumps and whatever, just to make it look beautiful. But a lot of them, most of them identified with sort of uh, genus species, uh, edible, not edible, we don't know. And it was beautiful and really, uh, really interesting. And then they have uh, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, mushroom ID, uh, emergency services for poisonings, uh, how do you cook mushrooms, uh, a bunch of other sorts of things related to mushrooms. So all about soil health and all that. And it was really fun talking to some of those people about um, some of that stuff. Sorry for the tangent. Um, but I thought you didn't enjoy the that curious visit. And I'll, again, I'll post some of the pictures in, in the chat in a second. Um, Stuart, go ahead. No, I was going to ask Klaus if he could just frame what it was that um, that you guys were talking about. Okay, um, uh, that was one. And two, I'm I'm feeling a little lightheaded, so I'm just not sure about how long I'm going to last on the call today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just uh, uh, saying that there has been some real practical benefit coming out of this volume one book already. Um, one was that the discovery that um, the most major climate models have either underestimated or completely omitted the impact of the hydrologic cycles uh, as a contributor to climate change. And that's very dangerous because there is an acceleration taking place caused by the way water reacts you know, to, to temperature changes um, and to and, and importantly the the inter the interrelationship between soil and water. Uh, and then we came to talk about this conversation I had that I got into with uh, Savory uh, on LinkedIn. Um, where he commented on an article that I had posted in an AI-generated article on um, the impact of uh, of soil on and water, and he he got really interested reading this because he was saying there is an intelligence here that uh, uh, is beyond mine. I mean, he expressed it differently, but uh, I could have, he basically saying I could have not put this together, this line of reasoning, the way this AI does it. And then he proceeded to communicate with me um, through some really lengthy diatribes that he was posting. Um, and I took his postings and ran them through the AI. And I said, translate that into, uh, into an orange language. Um, because in his, in his like combative uh, exchange that he had with Monbiot, who is this British uh, journalist who uh, is is very outspoken about uh, we have to all become vegan and and and, and disputing Savory's uh, assertions that rotational grazing practices uh, have the capacity to restore grasslands back to health, um, and so then it became really obvious that the difference between Monbiot and Savory. Uh, is that they're talking about something completely different. Monbiot is talking about the exchange of greenhouse gases you now that that uh, uh, you would get putting cattle on the on on grasslands. And so he's he's counting methane and CO2 and sequestration capacity and all of this and establishes a net balance of those two. And then he declares this a failure because the net balance is at best break even. Whereas, whereas Savory is talking about something entirely different. He's talking about the restoration of the soil microbiome, you know, that comes through the introduction of biomass when you put animals on the, on the soil. And then when you do that, when, when the, there is a direct relationship between the biomass, uh, the, the soil microbiome in the soil and its capacity to, to absorb and hold water, right? So, so the, the so so uh, uh, um, savory is is saying that um, the the depletion of of biodiversity the the, the depletion of uh, 
uh, of plant of plants on the soil is a root cause for contributing to global climate change and the destruction of the biosphere. And savory, to add some detail, is a particular um, champion of holistic planned grazing, which has, I think, many different names, but but basically that livestock on the land are really important for land health. That's, yeah. that, that's his that's his mission. Yeah. Yeah. And Monbiot's not a not a fan of of livestock on land, I think. Well, he he is arguing that it's actually destructive. You know, and and so and, and it's just intuitively strange that he would say something like this. And then it turns out that he has these completely mechanistic uh, uh understanding of uh of life. Uh, and and so so he comes really from a bright orange viewpoint, and he doesn't understand uh, you know, the sanctity of life and uh, the in the interrelationships, you know, the connection connections uh, within within life, within soil and and the living living world. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know how this relates at all, but I watched. Um, a chunk of the first episode of um, Ken Burns' recent uh, documentary about um, buffalo, about bison, um, about how um, quickly it was decimated. Uh, it became like a gold rush um, during the 1800s. And it, I, yeah, I didn't really know that much about it, but you know, the numbers of um, slaughtered bison and how decimated the bison herds were um but they were you know they were grazing the the grasslands and the plain and had had been the life force of of, of native americans for um many many centuries mm -hmm. 40 million bisons yeah yeah the doctor's titled the american buffalo yeah mm -hmm. I had not heard of it. It was like it was kind of like a gold. It became kind of like a gold rush, where all of a sudden these people were were um, heading west and engaging in um, um, in decimating the buffalo herds just to harvest the um, the car the um, the skins. Um, actually, actually, the government or the military, I don't remember which. I don't know if he goes into it in the documentary because I haven't watched it. Uh, basically put bounties on it and they did it to uh, extinguish the livelihoods of the Native Americans who lived in the plains. It was a, it was an Indian removal policy and then it became a hobby and people would go out, you know, Buffalo Bill notably. Yeah, it, it's absolutely horrendous. These are Buffalo skulls. Mm -hmm. And it was done to to basically take the life support from the Indians we are not nice people, huh? <laughs> Amazing. No. No. And in some ways, you know, the analogous is, is um, I think, you know, destroying the biosphere um, for commercial purposes. Um, yeah. So by, by 1889, bison numbered in the hundreds. And that there's a book titled The Extermination of the American Bison, which was written a long time ago, in 1889. Yeah, it's astounding. Amazing stuff. Um, uh, Stuart, you um, had sent me a comment that you had made some annotations and comments to your manuscript. I haven't had a chance to to look at them. Um, any thoughts, reflections on where you are and what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, it's ready for people to take a look at and let's see what they have a what they have to say. I mean, the piece that I that I added was um, was a little piece of of um, the future um, and the agreement. Um, that uh, you know the the fantasy of the agreement that that people came to agree to um, to move forward into the future. Um, you want to say just a little bit more about it, just to give us more flavor. Um, 
yeah, it's kind of things got so bad <laughs> that essentially it was realized, hey, um, we don't have much of a choice here. So let's see if we can't um, uh, create an agreement about how we might move forward as a species, um, given that um, the current notion of nation state governance um, is not gonna work um, to get us out of the morass we're in in the future. And so, um, enough um, of the sovereigns agreed to have a, um, a different reality going forward. Um, their attempt to save um, the human species and to say, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a different reality, uh, meaning a different set of facts or goals or assumptions. I'm, I'm not clear on which, which particular, there's so many like weird, agreements that have been struck in different societies in different places around the world. I'm just trying to narrow down which which set of, of things you're working with. Yeah, a different set of agreements going forward for how how we're gonna how we're gonna <clears throat> govern um, how human beings act um, going forward. The notion of nation states, you know, people realize um, we're not gonna get very far um, and we've got to change. Um, and so that's, that's the essential agreement. There's a new, um, uh, it also includes, um, a new form of quote, 10 commandments or 12 or whatever the number is, you know, for how we're going to be with each other going forward as human beings. So cool. those, those, those few things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Um, Pete, any reflections on the process and stuff we've been talking about as it relates to the manuscripts coming up and stuff? Um, I, uh, yeah, we need, um, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's so in my terminology or my um, cosmology, um, we need a uh, little bit more of an editorial team and 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 a project plan to to move towards publication some more. We got from A to from A to Z, yeah, or whatever. Okay. Yeah. So, Pete, in the ideal world, what would the editorial scheme looks like? If if you know. Um. Uh, I know I know Klaus's book a little bit better, um, so I can kind of talk through that a little bit. Um, uh, kind of an analogy to a, a typical publication process, uh, you'd um, uh, an author would be working with uh, an editor at a at a publishing house, uh, and the editor would. Uh, the editor and his or her team, uh, along with the publication kind of process team, would take care of uh, getting review copies or actually pre-review copies. They would they would uh, be in charge of uh, project management of getting galleys out to um, people to kind of do fact checking and you know um, you know getting getting a diamond in the rough, you know, more polished and more ready for publication. Um, uh, in there, there would also be just uh, proofreading, uh, looking for typos and, and you know, grammar, grammar checks and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. towards, towards the end of that, there would start to be a process of um, uh, going from uh, roughs to camera ready, you know, nicely types out um, pages, um, in, insertion of uh, diagrams and figures, uh, copyright, copyright clearance for that kind of thing. Um, uh, and then the technical work of getting the print ready pages bound and shipped and all that kind of stuff. So 
I kind of imagine a similar pipeline. Um, uh, it would be shaped differently or collaborate differently, but there's a process where I think uh, somebody like Klaus or yourself should not necessarily be in charge of the NeoBooks pipeline from, you know, hey, I've got a diamond in the rough to um, something that's, you know, turned into a saleable ebook, um, maybe print on demand copies, uh, turned into uh, smaller nuggets uh, to be reassembled into other NeoBooks, uh, a lot set up on a NeoBooks website, kind of a virtual bookshelf. Um, so I think we, you know, the, the, the larger idea of the NeoBooks concept, um, it, it sounds to me like kind of a, in, in a way, maybe open source or community, uh, community led uh, publishing process. Uh, and it doesn't go to, it, it's not really meant to go to paper as much as it's meant to go to wikis and ebooks and things like that. But conceptually, it's still the same thing, right? You need um, the Google Docs version to turn into uh, Markdown and HTML versions, Markdown or HTML versions, maybe. Um, and then those need to turn into EPUB and they need to turn into websites and wikis and things like that. So there's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a kind of a chicken and egg process. Uh, we talked about this early on and, um, and there wasn't anything to publish. So it didn't make sense to have a publishing pipeline, but now we have something to publish and we need a publishing pipeline more or less. And kind of the question is we're not a publishing house, but how much of the publishing pipeline can we sort of successfully put together and how much of it, um, what, what are the essential parts of it? I mean, uh, at this point, we're probably not gonna create an index, for example. And it may well be that indexing software is simple and easy to do, but that, that's a piece that would normally happen in a book that we're likely to just let you know let go for, for this. There's other stuff the, that we should- The could... replacement for an index now is, is a chat. Um, can I chat with this book? Right. And we uh, could do that. And what, what do we need to do to make a, a book's corpus or contents chat friendlier or accessible because we're publishing openly anyway, which means that these things will be available for search or for feeding into a chatbot uh, or an engine, uh, an LLM. But what else could we do that, that would make it easier to chat with a book? Um, it's a good question and, and a longer longer discussion. Um, uh, OpenAI just like today um, or last, last yesterday or something like that, um, ChatGPT is now going to have native um, PDF, you know, upload this PDF and chat with this PDF native to ChatGPT. So maybe there's not much to do. Um, maybe there's, uh, um, it, it would be lovely to do that, to have a, a um, fine tuned model that you publish on Hugging Face that, that represents the, you know, the, the book basically, or a collection of books, even better. Uh, maybe the new book and and some of its reference material, whatever open reference material, you know. So I, something like that. Um, in the olden days, you would have made an index. In the new days, you'd publish a fine-tuned model to Hugging Face. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. So just posting to the Hugging Face would be a a step we would add in. Yeah, and and it's not like we, you know, if the book is is open license. It's not like we've precluded that, but we've also not enabled it either, right? So um, the I I don't know I don't know if this sounds like a lot of busy work or not, um, but uh, but it's clear to me that assembling a book is not the same as having it be accessible. Assem assembling a book and I put it in a in a public place is not the same thing as making it accessible. And I think if we haven't made it accessible, then we haven't done our job. Uh, do you want to riff on that a bit? Because I think I totally agree with you. It's it's kind of I I've you know pretty much said it all already. Um, I think so. It's it's kind of an odd thing because I don't know that any of us really volunteered to be the you know the the thing that I said, it's kind of like NeoBooks or the NeoBooks pipeline or the NeoBooks community as a publishing company. And, you know, that, that seems heavyweight. 
but I don't I don't mean it to be heavyweight. I just mean it to be com completionary. Um, you know, um, there's there's not a lot of reason to create a neo book if you're not going to go the extra mile somehow. So I think I think somehow it's incumbent on somebody, and I don't know who, to build that community that's doing the the work of you know, the, the, that whole pipeline. The different parts. Um, a oh. couple of things. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, um, I, I was just going to back up a little bit and ask uh, that, uh, Pete, could you elaborate a little bit on Hugging Face's role in the ecosystem at this point and why it's important to... to yeah, I, so a big caveat. Um, I am not really a Hugging Face user. Um, I've... Oh. My my LLM, my LLM and image stuff has been away from fine-tuned models. But as I understand it, Hugging Face, you could think of Hugging Face as, I don't know if this is going to work, but you could think of hug, Hugging Face as the GitHub for um, uh, AI models rather than source code um, or text someday. So it's, um, it's a... Or maybe another way to think of it, and this is something I'm even less familiar with, but there's open access uh, scientific journal uh, hubs. I don't know if SciHub is one or, or not. Um, uh, and but it's it's the same thing. It's uh, or SlideShare. Maybe a SlideShare is a is a thing that you could think of as in business terms. It's a place where somebody collected uh, a ton of PPTs. You know. So hugging face is kind of the same thing. It's it's a place where everybody goes to post and download um, fine tune models. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I since while I'm while I'm talking, other places that you would want something to go to is um, however you meet up with um, the library face of uh, the Internet Archive. You know you want. Uh, They've got a process, and I don't know if they they even do it for individual like ebook kinds of things. But um, you know, whatever uh, open libraries and things like that, um, maybe even Project Gutenberg or whatever. You know, there are places where um, free texts have ended up. You know, um, like like uh, like tumbleweeds drift out, you know, piling or bison skulls. Um, uh, where they've, you know, ended up with a, a huge corpus of open texts. And so we should make sure to publish to those too. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, the Neo Books thing is my idea originally. And that means that I've, I've signed up to be the the lead on figuring out how to do the process and, and how to, you know, uh, how to form up some semblance of an editorial and production process. Um, so it's sort of in my lap and I'm not, I'm, I'm like, I'm not exactly sure how to complete it. Um, but I, I appreciate your detailing it and us talking about it. And we've made some, we've taken a couple bites out of this, but not, we've not sort of figured out how to digest the whole thing. Um, and again, and, and that was by intent too, you know, it's yeah. like, okay, there's a thing, let's start taking bites and see where we get to. And so now we've got a, a great, uh, milestone, um, and now we can uncover more milestones in front of that. Exactly. And and just thinking out loud, um, we could skip a couple steps to get to something we can publish to get something out in the world that looks interesting. Um, and then it might have some typos in it. And you know, we might we might kind of reverse some of the steps in the sense of one of the conceits of the Neo book is that versioning is is easy and important in Neo books. And the first version might not be. A very polished version and the third version might be like really good because we managed to uh, sort of connect with enough people who cared about the, the issues and the way they're being expressed to join in and improve the different nuggets that compose the work um, but that kind of means that the first thing out needs to be attractive enough to do that and for a lot of people a manuscript with a lot of typos and janky text is just a bounce they just they just will stop reading right there um, for other people, a, a series of good ideas clearly expressed up high enough that they get there might be a hook that that captures them and says, well, gosh, this this is really messy text, but I could help make it a lot better because that's my skill. And then we're off to the races. But I, and I don't know where that balance is. But I fear that 
I, I fear that, and I think we all don't want to do this, but I fear that holding ourselves to the standard of a published book from, you know, Random House uh, at this at this stage is is like way, way be, sort of beyond our reach and also um, not intentionally where we're, where we're aiming right now with like the quick first book. Does that make sense? Klaus, yeah. please. Yeah, I wouldn't worry so much about typos because the software is pretty good to prevent that. Um, but the, the, it's more about the flow you now and uh, uh, maybe in some cases unnecessary repetitions and so on and so on. So I think it's more uh, uh, style, uh, stylistically, you know, the, the, so the, to, to, to make sure this flows. And then the other thing, of course, is you know, to make uh, sure that all these uh, statements uh, are defendable. Uh, and so we don't have some boo-boo in there where it, the whole thing collapses because someone was able to contradict like one thing, you know, and, and then the, you, know, you lose your credibility. Or because ChatGPT hallucinated something that doesn't actually exist. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I think in this conversation, we're realizing that fact-checking is going to be a big thing. So, yeah. So, does, so the same is all for me in a, in a slightly different way. Um, whatever, whatever we decide that we want to put out there as our, quote, initial finished product, um, credibility is a word that I think pops up as important. Um, because if, if, if whatever it is that we, quote, publish um, doesn't have credibility, you know, people are not gonna um, not gonna want to innovate, create. Um, uh, add to it in in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be credible. That I mean, that's the word that pops up. You know, um, it doesn't have to be perfect, um, but it needs it needs to be credible. And the other thing, and and what I thought I heard. Pete, was that you said um, the iterations going forward um, um, should not be, oh, not controlled, but 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 the original author should not be so engaged with that. And I would push back on that a little bit because I think the the initial author may have some sense of you know, where this might go and how others might um, iterate, contribute, because essentially we're trying to create something that's um, that's creative, um, you know. That, yeah, that I, I don't disagree. And I, I, it was the, the way I said it, um, <laughs> that was weird. Um, uh, the, the way I said it was, um, a consequence of Jerry and I talking about some of the next steps and Klaus going, but <laughs> I just wanted to write volume two. I don't know, you know. Um, so there's there's just some fairly mechanical stuff that needs to go on. Um, you know, how do we get more people involved? How do we, you know, I, I don't know. Even the project management of that doesn't necessarily have to be I, I think the you're entirely right. The the um, the original author should be involved in the evolution of the book. Um, you know, from from Diamond and Rough to V1 to V2 to V3 to V4. I totally agree. Um, and if if it's left, if if all of that work, if all of that is the responsibility of the original author. Um, uh, I, we, we're asking for a, a unicorn kind of, right? Somebody who has subject matter expertise can do the writing and then can do all the community management and, and technical publication stuff that, you know, so the, the, the way I tried to, the, the analogy I tried, tried to draw between a uh, typical book publishing uh, with a old style publishing house and paper books, bound paper books, there's a that is not something that most authors do. They don't do that whole process. They don't, you know, um, and and that's all I kind of wanted to convey was that um, 
you know, there's, there's a bunch of fairly mechanical stuff that needs to be done by, by the community and not by the author. Hey, Jay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just to add, um, two thoughts. One, um, I know that for uh, the original author to add a bunch of reflective questions, um, based upon knowledge of the, of, of, you know, the big overview, I think that could add a lot to the, to the, to, to the creativity going forward. Um, you know, pointing in, in, in direction. Two, um, The, the, the idea of the editorial process that um, that Barrett Kohler uses, and I think that Jerry will, will understand this, it's a little unique in that um, as opposed to having one editor, um, a manuscript is, 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 you know, is read by um, three, four people. So I remember kind of sitting there with three, four people commenting on the manuscript and then you know, sitting there scratching my head a little, but it really does make for, um, I think, a better outcome in in terms of having you know the different perspectives of of different different people. Yeah. There's. Go ahead, Pete. I. Even still, I, even at Barrett Kohler, I I I don't know much. Well, I know more than I should, and probably not enough to to even say this, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you have an, an editor uh, at a book publisher that, that he or she is not going to be the only person that even looks at the book, right? That's basically your contact person who's managing a team of people, all of whom are, you know, there's people looking at the book, there's people like, you know, thinking about how they're going to get it on paper, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I totally agree. Um, uh, it should, it shouldn't be, you know, an editor, it should be an editorial team. I, I another thing in here, and it's buried so deep in my consciousness that I probably don't even say it anymore. But um, it's it's apparent to me that a neo book is going to be more like software than a paper book, in in the sense that it's going to continue to evolve afterwards. So if you think of open source software, what happens is um, you make a you make a release, you give it a number. There's actually a specific format for the numbering scheme you use with the three digits. Um, it's called uh, semantic versioning. Um, so you give it a version number 1.0.0 or whatever, um, and you put it in a place where people can make comments on it. And then pretty soon you go, oh, whoops, I, I need to add this. So now it's v1.1.0. And now, you know, somebody else has come in and they've changed whole sections of it. Now it's 2.1.0 and, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think we should expect NeoBooks to have version stamps and for the version stamps to be fairly fine-grained and for there to be incremental evolution of the thing uh, over time involving you know the author and the editorial publishing team and larger communities around them totally agree um oh, so just... wait a minute, wait a minute. hold on so are you saying... i'll hold my thought thank you pete are you saying that that you know it would be kind of like um you know, first edition, second edition, third edition. Much more fine-grained. Because my conception is that it will be much more um, alive and evolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much more fine-grained. That's okay. what that's what Peter's saying. Is that and, is that and software can change day by day, right? right. Or even like int intra day. You know, okay. oh oh wow, we've we fixed four bugs today. You know, and there's four different version numbers. Okay. So, so Tesla, when it makes one of their electric vehicles, is making mods all the time to the software, and every vehicle ships out with a digital twin in archive of exactly what version of everything they ship that car with, hardware and software. Uh, but they're making constant changes, where normal car makers make a bunch of changes every two years or something like that, when they sort of cycle the model and, and, and do whatever. So Tesla has completely changed the game on how cars are, are modified. And it's a little bit analogous to what we're talking about here, where um, when anybody decides to get an ebook, uh, so what one barrier we'll have here is that posting a book on Kindle, for example, 
uh, will mean will be a process we probably won't do that often. So those would be like major major revs or major releases. It would be lovelier to be able to have a perfectly updated version of whatever the latest version of all the approved nuggets are rolled up and spit out whenever anybody were to go acquire a book on, on Amazon, a Kindle version. Uh, we might be able, uh, just like Pete's massive wiki will regenerate a website whenever you make a change to any page in that website's massive wiki page uh, vault, um, it might be possible to create an EPUB, not the Kindle upload to Kindle kind of version, but the version that somebody could buy or download or whatever uh, from a website, that could be completely up to date. Um, and that might be a really interesting change to the process and how people perceive the process. And then and then the, the semantic version version would be really important because you'd be like, oh, okay, uh, this this is precisely where uh, where all the nuggets come from. That, that I, I like that idea a bunch. And, and I think if we make that clear uh, with the introduction to the Neo book, um, it may take a little bit off from the pressure to be perfect, right? I mean, it's basically saying this is, you know, as good as we got it to this point, knowing and understanding that, you know, modifications will, will have to come. I mean, the reason why I wanted to close down chapter one, because there is sort of a functional shift in how I look at volume two. Um, and that actually fits in really well with this uh, conversation that we just had about uh, the adaptability. So, so uh, can I just show you for a moment what I've done? I, Go for it. Okay. Um, so, it's so I'm titling it uh, "Leading from the Future as It Emerges," and that is the. Um, of course, that is the maybe bigger. Um, that is the theory U concept, right? Um, so we have sort of collectively reached the point of presencing where everybody understands how much trouble we're really in. So we, we don't talk so much anymore about um, the evolutionary concepts of you know, uh, agriculture and food systems and and what have you, but. We have reached uh, an understanding, but now we are connecting to the source. We are engaging collective creativity. Um, and then we're working to, with an open heart, open mind, and open will towards finding solutions. And the reason why we are saying leading from the future as it emerges is that we don't want to define the future in the absence of really knowing what that should be. You know, because we are exploring and we don't want to land on any concept that fixates our, us towards an outcome that may actually not be achievable or maybe the wrong thing to, to wanting to achieve. Um, so so then I'm, I, I you know, wrote this, I mean, I'm, I'm prompted this forward here. We need to rekindle our broken bond with the biosphere in a changing climate. Now, so we, we have we have lost uh, our connection to to uh, to life now to Gaia, and so so we need to uh, restore that the dichotomy of abundance and deprivation. So we have this unparalleled parallel scale of, uh, of being able to feed billions, um, but uh, uh, in the process, our biosphere is gasping for breath. Now, as we are depleting the soil microbiome and water cycles go haywire. So the earth has enough to satisfy our needs, but not our greed. And then from science to societal change. And I'm getting increasingly frustrated with what we understand as science uh, because it's mechanistic and it misses you know, the, the, the linkage with uh, with life you know, as, as a... Uh, uh, as an entity. Um, so with technological solutions, while technological solutions are essential, you know, they aren't uh, everything. And we will explore in this new book, the solutions also lie in the realm of social engineering. Spiral dynamics helps us understand this complex issue by breaking down the collective psyche in different colors. Um, you know, orange thrives on competition and achievement, Green wants to see community welfare, holistic views, and shared resources. Um, 
and then so a call ahead. So this is uh, an existential call to action. And, and honestly, I mean, I know you all uh, keep watching uh, what is happening uh, out there, but we have passed some tipping points that you can't uh, put back into the box. Uh, and most of them are related to water. Now, the trillions of gallons of fresh water streaming into the oceans are disrupting the Gulf streams and, and slowing down already. And so, so there, there are things happening that are just, uh, uh, that are just uh, pointing towards a very challenging future. Um, but so it says with 95% confidence here, you know, to reconnect <clears throat> our bond with the biosphere, with Gaia, it's not just a philosophical issue, it's an existential issue. Yeah, yeah so this is actually, when you think about this, uh, it's a crazy statement to read, you know, that uh, the AI with 95% certainty is talking about an existential issue for humanity. Um, so then, um, so then the unsustainable quantum industrial agriculture is fraying the fabrics of Earth ecosystem. So, and then I'm going through the you know, topics that we and I'm just briefly touching on an exhausting cycle, soil depletion, water resource depletion, disrupting the web of life. You know, through a high yield monoculture paradigm, uh, a clarion call for change. Yeah. We shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive, from Albert Einstein here. And nowhere is this truer than in the sphere of food and agriculture. You know, the undeniable truth, the current tra trajectory of industrial agriculture is untenable. You know, as we dive deeper, exploring holistic and integrative visions, of even global systemic solutions, we must rethink how we grow food. No? Um, it's not just existential, but immediate. A change catalyzed both by technological innovation and a renewed social consciousness. It's no longer a lofty ideal, but a pressing necessity. And he puts 98% certainty on that statement. No? Um, so from harmony to homogenization, the evolution of agriculture and its impact on bioregional diets that we talked uh, in the first uh, edition about the need uh, for bioregional uh, approaches to restoring biosystems um, and uh, displacement of now our evolutionary knowledge, ancient wisdom. Um, and then I'm, I'm, so now I'm starting to transition into, so what does this actually mean in practical terms? Well, the first step is we need to reduce animal protein consumption. Now, this is the most immediate, the most practical, uh, the most impactful change and adaptation that we should take. Um, and so, and and so from there, then multi-crop farming, a case for integrated multi-crop farming, a sustainable alternative to monocrop, monocropping and CAFOs. So I'm explaining here, you know, the uh caloric efficiency, environmental benefits, just to set the stage. So this is how, how, as, how as far as I've gotten, just to set the stage for what does this mean in practical terms? Now, how do you operationalize these transitions? And that's in, in, in virtually every conversation that you have on LinkedIn or with specialists and scientists, they all, uh, talk about uh, you know solutions, but but you don't get a practical pathway that gets you from point A to point B to point C, you know? and and so that's what I'm trying to lay out, and this is explorative, um, and so I just connected here in Bend, you know, with with a, with a group of locals, farmer and so on, because I need to learn myself, you know, so I need to explore. How does this really function? And then as I, in every conversation and in every interaction, I get a new idea, you know, and then spin that into the book. So, so thank you, Klaus. Um, my, my take on what you just said is a beautiful example of, I think, where we're trying to head in terms of framing. In other words, 
the the piece that you added at the beginning um, was so here's the crisis we're in. <laughs> okay, here's the absolute crisis that we're in. Um, here's my expertise about what we need to do. Um, and then it's a step of, you know, what do you think? <laughs> what can you add to it? What, what, what flaws or holes do you see in my suggestion? Um, that's, that's my take on, 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 on what you've done so far. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Klaus. Um, it's nice to have a preview of what, you're, what you want to write next and where that's going. Um, a couple thoughts. And then I'll go back to the thought I was going to say earlier. Um, I have a feeling I have no exhaustive coverage of books on sustainability and how we might fix all these problems. But I think that there's a bunch of books that are specific about, hey, we need to replace capos with regenerative agriculture. Like, like I, I don't, I have a feeling that there's there's already multiple books out there that are doing what you're just saying, what you're saying here. They may not do it in this way or in this structure. Uh, but they, they recommend these sorts of things. That this, this feels familiar to me. It's certainly in, from blog posts, from lengthy blog posts. Um, second thing is, the thing I wind up thinking is, well, great, all we have to do is reduce protein demand, like, like animal protein demand. That is a gigantic, unrealistic thing, unless somebody hacks the human uh, psyche in some really clever way. And maybe that means, and I'm just making this up, Maybe that means you poise, you drop poison in the beef supply somewhere so that people are suddenly like, oops, won't touch beef because it's bad. Like all beef seems to be tainted. What are we going to do? And this, this gets into the, the territory of ministry for the future where people desperate about what's happening to them wind up taking underhanded means to actually achieve very rational uh, things that nobody's actually doing rationally because it involves painful and large-scale behavioral change. So I'm, 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 I'm particularly interested in any kinds of hacks or strategies to change people's minds at scale uh, uh, to do those kinds of things. And I haven't seen that much creative work on that front. And that's like the next piece of, of, of text after that. It's like, hey, these the, we've been, you know, many people have been saying these things for a long time, but how do we actually get there? And I think that that's a, a big hurdle and a, a, a giant thing to, to achieve somehow. And then I want to go back, having said all of that, I want to go back to the thing I was going to say earlier, which is an alternate path to getting our, the first book out is actually to publish it serially as blog posts, going back to, uh, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, a whole uh, Mark Twain, a whole bunch of people used to write books uh, serially, and they would publish in newspapers or magazines, and then the book would come out at the end, and everybody would be waiting for the next episode of the magazine, because everything was slow, and that's how it worked. Uh, and what in our world, the way we're thinking about this, setting it out as blog posts gets each blog section vetted and improved and critiqued as they go uh, in, in the good crowdsourcing way that blogging will do if it gets enough attention. And then we roll up the blog posts into a book and march off to town. And, and the blog posts would be equal to markdown files on GitHub. It's just that we would copy them and paste them on Medium or some other uh, place where they would get more attention as blog posts. So that's back to production strategy. But that would be a very familiar production strategy for anybody uh, you know, online. And there have been books that are basically compendiums of blog posts. That, that's, not a, that's not a novel thing. Now the challenge is <clears throat> to, to uh, get enough people. There, there are actually a lot of people out there who are interested in engaging. I was uh, uh, doing a presentation last week to the uh, Climate Reality Project, now the Al Gore uh, thing there. Um, and I had a, a, an opportunity to explain the hydrologic cycle and how that is linked to the soil and so on. And I got so many emails, what should I do and how can I do, interact with this? And there is there's plenty of stuff out there already. I mean, you're right. I mean, all of these programs exist. They're just not being acted upon at scale. So the, the thing then is, if we do have one activity that, that says, let's reduce meat consumption, then you go and develop a chapter, what's out there? You know, don't create anything because anything you could think of, somebody has done already, right? 
And so let's just let's just embrace what's out there and see which one of these things fits to your particular community and interest and capacity. You know? what, what, before going to Stuart, one of the virtues of the blog post version of this is that anything you wrote about the hydrological cycle, the small water cycle and the large water cycle and how they fit could be posted immediately at a blog post you could just keep pointing to. And now it's like, hey, I wrote this, everybody go look at this. And then later we roll that up into the larger narrative of what's happening. But but one of the nice parts of the blog strategy is it lets you have things you can point to and work up some enthusiasm over, over time immediately. So my understanding is that Substack would be uh, the, the the way to go here. Uh, uh, very, very like that's that's but, one interesting way and Pete might recommend Ghost or something different, but sub, a Substack pub is one way of getting seems to be the most popular yeah, yeah. And, and also it has the capacity to to travel extremely fast uh, but i have no idea never touched it <laughs> no, no so um i mean if i could get some help setting something like this up and creating this linkage you know maybe maybe doing it through ogm you know that ogm has a sub stack that maybe linked to neo books uh, on 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 specific topics you know, then uh, me as an author, I have something to just throw into. That would not be, I don't think that's a high, a heavy lift. Pete, what do you think? Um, it's not a heavy lift and it's a great idea. Uh, there's some discussion to be had about Substack versus Ghost. Right. Um, but but I can envision a, a Substack that is basically a serial publication queue where it's not always the same theme and we say so. It's like, hey, hey, this Substack pub is basically a way to generate a, a series of books. They're going to have different topics and you'll see them come out, you know, dripped over time. They might actually interlace as different authors are doing different pieces. But for each one, we'll basically say this is functionally chapter two of this book over here. Here's a link to it. You can go see the skeleton of the book now, whatever, whatever. So that as the pieces show up, they have they are contextualized individually. And that I don't think that would confuse too many people. I think that would probably work. Do you put in mailing lists into Substack? How does that work? Substack is a mailing list blog combo. And, See, and so have, is Ghost. I, I don't have huge mailing lists. No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think Substack works like Mailchimp. Meaning, I don't think you load Substack up with a bunch of emails you have of people you'd like to send it to. I think what you do is you use Mailchimp to, to or or just a, a bunch of email sends to say, "Hey, come sign up for my Substack." I don't mm. think you can pre-sign people would, up. For Substack, I would say it differently. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, um, people subscribe to your Substack, which is essentially an email list. But but you can't force them into your Substack by just. I, I think you probably could. I I could go look. Really? Oh, that'd be interesting. Okay. Right. I I but, think people have you, to voluntarily the, sign up. A, a big reason you use Substack instead of, for instance, Ghost, uh, is because they have a lot of I don't uh, a lot of uh, distribution power already. So. They, they get your content in front of people who are going to subscribe to it. What happens inside Substack is that um, a, a Substack, you know, people who read this Substack also read these others. You get a lot of cross fertilization that way. And they do that inside of Substack. Uh, they also get, you know, people who make comments and notes, those get forwarded and those become like little article posts sort of things as well. So there's, there's traffic or flow inside of Substack, sort of like the traffic or flow that, that happens around code on GitHub. Uh, only pretty different. Go ahead, Stuart. One one thought that I had as we we're talking about this is, um, <clears throat> for want of a better term, and there might be a better term, but um, publishing some kind of uh, guidelines, ground rules, suggestions for folks that will be um, commenting, iterating, um, you know, adding ideas. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know what that would look like, because um, I don't want to kind of um, um, confine it too much. But I think that that might be an important piece about yeah. what it is what it is we're looking for. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great idea, and it's it's really typical in an open source project to have um, contributor guidelines. You know, here's the things you can help with. Here's the 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 ways that you can be most productive when you're helping. Um, here's the things that are counterproductive. Please don't do that. It's <laughs> yeah. really common <laughs> Thank and, you. and smart. It's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, you know. 
And I'd say it in one you know, phrase, you know, don't be an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Um, it goes from contributor guidelines. Uh, a bigger open source project will actually have community guidelines as well, right? The the uh, a bigger open source project turns into a community of people, not just an iteration of the content, but an iteration of the whole community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Evolution. The so real quick, the Substack Ghost thing. They're very similar. Um, they're they're kind of they're they're what Medium wanted to be kind of, and they're a replacement for blogs. Um, and they're also a mailing list. Um, uh, Substack is the more commercial and maybe a little bit more exploitative one. And uh, Ghost is the open source underdog. So um, you go to Substack uh, because it has that great great cross feeding um, thing. Um, and in some ways, it's like GitHub that way. Um, uh, in some ways, it's completely opposite of GitHub because the reason you come to GitHub is for open source community. For Substack, it's uh, commercial gain, basically. And on Substack, you can set price points and let people contribute to the project. Yeah. or And you can determine what they get for free or what they get when they achieve certain paid levels kind of thing. It's like, like Patreon that way. Uh, Ghost does the same thing. Mm-hmm. So there are reasons to pick Ghost uh, over Substack, um, and there are reasons that you'd be, you know, um, less happy because you weren't getting as much traffic. Aside from traffic, I think you would hit other drawbacks, Pete. Aside from what? Aside from traffic, the the traffic benefits of Substack versus Ghost. I think you you were using Ghost for your the Plex biweekly Flex. Are there any other drawbacks that you can that? They're they're very similar. Um, Substack uh, has a more productive business model, um, which is the way that capitalists say things, if you if you think about it. Um, uh, Substack has a more productive business model so that they are able to spend more money on uh, making Substack a little bit fancier. Substack is fancier and fancier. Ghost is plenty fancy for what we need. Um, and, uh, and it has a uh, community, you know, contributory, um, feel to it. Mm -hmm. So Plex is a ghost, a ghost uh, thing. I've also got a couple sub stacks too, which I don't, those sub stacks I don't charge money for. But it's a, it's a bit of a, a it's an ecological statement, which one you're choosing, um, as well as a, you know, market, m you know, market benefit thing. But, and let me go back to what I posted in the chat a little bit would go, which is are Substack and Ghost now replacing blogs as yeah. places people post? And they're replacing Medium too. <laughs> uh -huh. Medium blew it. Oh, it sucks. But yeah, Substack is the, Substack is what Medium was wanting to be. Uh, and it's also uh, the, the new way that you blog. And so the good news from my perspective is that um, a Substack newsletter uh, missive blog and modern blog post has a permalink that looks reasonably tidy when you go to Substack, but not really because there's no, it, you know, you, you can kind of go through an archive. It's, it's, I guess it's there better than, uh, better than it could be. Um, and the problem I have, like, like Cory Doctorow sends out his newsletters and he'll do, uh, articles that are inline to a way long newsletter and the permalinks are weird and flaky. And like, I get, I, I'm I'm trying to sort of chronicle and cap and uh, curate the really good stuff that he writes, and he makes it extra hard because the 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 nugget size and the and the and the permalink versioning and all that are, are kind of janky for me. Anyway, uh, but like, we're not going like to. Uh, and, <laughs> like and we're not, a in one sense it's a great blog post, and in another sense it's not nuggets, so you can't you can't direct, uh, deep link into. I have a. I have a standing request to Pete to uh, create permalinks to the, each post, each each article inside of a Plex uh, newsletter. Um, so Klaus, sorry, you were you were trying to jump into the conversation. No, 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 I'm good. I'm just following. Um, I mean, one thing I heard about Substack is it has the capacity to communicate to a million people in a very short period of time, which is why it's being used now by by. Uh, uh, organizations and groups who communicate want to communicate out in large volume but only if you get a million people to sign up for your substack or if you get 
the Substack people who to forward to a million people, the sub, your Substack subscribers. So you don't automatically gain that big an audience. Like on TikTok, if you figure out the algorithm and TikTok puts you in front of a whole bunch of people, you will get a giant audience really quickly. And, and they can't actually, as far as I understand it, they can't subscribe to you to make sure they get everything you do. They're just going to get what the algorithm puts in front of them in TikTok. And so everybody's trying to hack the algorithm in TikTok. But but the possibility of getting a giant audience is there and like right in front of you. There's no there's no barrier like I just described with Substack. Uh, and Pete, I think, is checking to see whether I'm wrong about what I'm saying, uh, because it could be the Substack works differently from what I imagine. But that's what I think is happening. Say that again? Um, that on Substack, you can only send to people who signed yeah. up for you. You can't force they, they, it. Conversely, to they can assertively, uh, affirmatively, they can affirmatively uh, subscribe to you. Yes, but they have Un to. Unlike TikTok. Yes. Right. Exactly. And on TikTok, it's, you can't. You can't make sure you see everything that some, a particular yeah. creator creates, which is weird. Like that, kind of the that same with Facebook, like, actually. Yeah. That seems like a strange thing to me. Um, Algorithm Uber Alice. Man, we live in that. We live in the age. Um, that was a lot of good stuff. Anything, anything else about where we are? So it seems like a Substack or a Ghost for nuggets as we write them is a good idea, and we all kind of like hmm, that. Sounds pretty good. So, uh, I, so I would, I would expand that a little bit. It should be. For, for blog posts in general. So sometimes it's nuggets, sometimes it's, you know, a call for participants, sometimes it's, you know, hey, we've released a new book um, or, you know, something. It, it should be blog posts. What, what we, people of this age think of as blog posts. So one way that that could play out is that what gets composed as the biweekly plex is actually a roll up of blog posts that went through the modified ghost or Substack stack uh, stream. And then they would have <clears throat> individual links. <laughs> the, so uh, the, I, the problem with that is, um, well, then you've got to decide, I, I guess it works. Uh, you could you could post a bunch of stuff that doesn't get into the email blast and then you can do a roll up that's the email blast. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. For some reason, I have a sense that a Substack, just because of the way I've experienced it is something that you sign up for slash pay for. Um, to become part of it now maybe maybe you don't have to pay for it but there is some there's some um there's some it's, it's got model. that yeah it's it's kind of like patreon um uh you can think of it depending on what you do on patreon substack is a replacement for patreon mm -hmm. um uh so the way it works is uh you can have in the olden days, you used to be able to have one substack thing. Now, now you can have multiple ones. So I've got two substacks. I have a substack, and I I'm writing about stuff that I think is important, and people can subscribe to it. I can choose to have free content and paid content. So some people, all of their content is paid, except for maybe some teaser stuff. Um, other people, like me, all of their content is free. You can do it either way. <clears throat> Just a lever to set. Okay. Yeah. And it, the, so, so from Stub, Substack's point of view, the free, um, the free content that I publish is a loss leader for all of their paid content. Substack wins when they take a cut of somebody's paid content, and so, and they they want you to do that. So they okay. you know they're they're letting me freeload, which is nice of them, but. It's also anti nice of them because they're building a publishing empire that you know now Ghost has to compete with. Does Substack um, do anything strange with intellectual property rights? Not that I'm aware of. Are there any complications <clears throat> for publishing through them? No. Okay. Um, there, there is some controversy about um, The, the biggest controversy I know is that in the early days, they kind of promised that, you know, hey, publish on Substack will monetize your content. Um, and um, in the back end, what they were doing is getting some of the, the best bloggers or whatever of the time and paying them a lot of money over, um, you know, over on top of whatever um, circulation income they were getting. 
and and they kind of hid that fact. So it looked like, oh wow, everybody, every every writer who's writing good content can get rich from Substack, and that, that was true for a few people who were getting Substack's VC money. Hmm. Hmm. But, you know, there's there's still a, a good utility, um, but at the same time, they're also part of the extractive capitalism world, unlike Ghost. And Ghost and Substack are very similar in in uh, capability. No offense, uh, Substack folks. I don't mean to cast aspersions on you. <laughs> there should be a Substack pub name, Casting Aspersions. There probably is. But if we go. can set this up, Pete, you know, I would love to take a look at it and see if I can incorporate this somehow too. Because the the there there are a lot of nuggets in book one that uh that stand individually. And actually if you if you try to frame them within the book, they just they get lost. It's just too much information. You know? I mean, for example, the spiral dynamics, there's this one chapter talking in colors. Yeah, you just release this and it's like a wow. And then people want to know more. But if you get the whole spiral dynamics section, uh, people don't get it. It's too much. Yeah. Which is one of the big reasons for neobooks to exist. Uh, that, that nuggets are really interesting on their own. Some of them deserve like to have a fruitful growing life over time. And uh, this is an attempt to provide a, an environment that does that. Um, Jay, are you kind of editor in chief or publisher of the uh, Neobooks? Um, I, I I was going to say Substack as a generic term, I, and I I I want us to I want to encourage us not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, so the generic term would probably be email newsletter, um, which is which sounds so 1990s uh, instead of Substack or Ghost or something like it. Um, we're we're cementing a a, a company that wants to be a monopoly. Um, uh, again, no aspersions, Substack. Um, so since I since I think that's a little bit counter mission, I, I think it behooves us to to think about whether we want to use Substack or Ghost and, mm -hmm. and wrestle that to the ground. But anyway, Jerry, um, are you the publisher of the uh, Neobooks um, email newsletter? I think I'm the publisher pro tem until somebody steps in who really, really, really wants to do that. And we're like, hey, sounds great. Or or are you the first person on the stewardship committee or something? Um, whatever makes sense that gives us enough kind of control or presence to 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 do it that way. But yeah, I think that's the me. the technical part of setup is like almost trivial. Yeah, I don't um, think there's that so much to do except the, to write some prose to describe it. And even that's kind of kind of optional. So the the this the the thing that I would think would hold this back, hold setting up an email newsletter back, is actually just um, uh, governance um, and you know co community form. Okay. Um, which we which we could finish in the next fourteen minutes. You mean choose governance models and other sorts of things, or what do you mean? Yeah. Or we could defer it for another call or something like that. But well, I was thinking we could do a little homework between now and next Monday to, and then just like block everything, and then unless we want to march ahead now. I mean, what I want to do is go say, look for some posts or videos that say like Substack versus Ghost, pluses and minuses, and just absorb some of that to see if there's something that I'm that I that I'm like, wait, what? Um, I, I I think that's valuable. Yeah. That's what I was gonna gonna try to do. Um, but I think then um, we've got to go ahead. Another question, uh, another homework question is, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good way to say this. Uh, um, business model. Um, uh, since the platform, both platforms support paid access. Um, I, I think it makes sense to think about what paid access means. Right. Um, uh, I, I will offer Plex as a great example. Um, 
uh, Plex has paid subscribers uh, and free subscribers, and they get exactly the same thing because whenever I push send and it says send this to everybody or send this just to paid, I always pick push send this to everybody. So that's one model, one potential model. Um, we could actually have tiered content too or something like that. But I think um, uh, I think it makes sense to start from the from the get go with um, with some paid offerings, yeah. even if it's even if it's like Plex where the paid is doesn't get you anything extra. I I agree, totally. So why don't we sort those things out and talk about it on Monday next, uh, and then we can make those decisions and start something up. That sounds good. And then one of the things this may just be me, but I would love for any post going through this channel to have uh, some context ahead of it that says this post is chapter figuratively right now, chapter two of this manuscript over here. And we should have a page up uh, somewhere on one of the massive wiki pages or something like that, that is the spine or the table of contents of that neo book. Uh, so that if somebody wanted, and, and all the other pages might be like empty pages, like, hey, this this chapter is going to be something about this. That's totally fine uh, because we're trying to sort of show that these things have context and are going to turn into a roll up and, and whatever else. And that way, as the topics vary of what's going through the channel, everybody will be like, they'll be oriented as we go through. Yeah. Uh, Stuart, you're muted. Yeah, that, that can also have the... Um... The effect or impact of this the serialization we talked about earlier um and getting people oh i can't wait till the next chapter comes out because i'm i'm kind of um engaged in this um this particular topic yeah mm -hmm. great i'm going to be in nashville with my daughter next uh, monday uh, i'll try to make it i'm not sure what the program is but she has three little girls well, actually, I call them my little terrorists, you know, the uh, uh, rather radical uh, um, little girls. <laughs> so we'll see. That should be fun. Yeah, we'll yeah. cross our fingers that you can make it into the into the call. I'm yeah. Off. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, everybody. Very productive. Yeah. Thanks, all. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao.